Well, I'm very happy to have joining me. And as I say this many times over the course of the last three and a half years, I'm so very grateful for organizations like Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. I've often said we need uh, conservatives need attorneys on our side. We need we need some good guys that have legal minds that are able to help us overcome much of what the left tries to throw at us or tries to get away with, including even some of our elected representatives that insist upon breaking the law in order to force through uh, their policies or their their politics on the citizens and. I am very happy, again, to have joining me this morning from Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty, attorney Lucas Weber. Good morning, Lucas. How are you? Hey, good morning, Meg. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. So I got a question. It's kind of a goofy one, but do you prefer to be called a uh, counsel as opposed to attorney? Because I know that's how your press release always lists every attorney with your organization. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, at will, we, we refer to uh, our official titles, are counsel. I'm a deputy counsel there, but uh, attorney counsel, it, it doesn't make any difference to me. All right. Well, right. I mean, because obviously you uh, have a legal mind that helps, again, uh, with the good guys, and, and I'm very happy about that. So let's talk about this recent lawsuit that the Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty filed against the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. Yeah, so under Wisconsin law, you need a liquor license uh, in two instances. Uh, the first is obviously if you're selling alcohol. The second is uh, if you are consuming alcohol in what's called a public place. Um, now, the term public place has never been interpreted to apply to private parties. So that's why, you know, your dinner party in your house or your barbecue in your backyard, you've never needed to get a liquor license for that. Um, and then based on kind of that understanding of the law, a cottage industry of, of event venues for weddings called wedding barns popped up all around the state. Uh, so these are farmers who have unused or underused agricultural buildings, typically a barn. They make investments in it to make it suitable to host events. Uh, and then they rent the space out to couples for the wedding day. Uh, and the couples can come in. They can throw their own party. Uh, the couples purchase and bring in their own alcohol. They serve their own alcohol to their guests you know, bring in their own food. They do everything on their own. Um, in that way, couples are able to save money, uh, a significant amount of money over over a more traditional wedding venue. Um, and it's, you know, I think we've all probably been, most of us anyways, have been to a barn wedding in Wisconsin. They're beautiful sites. It's kind of quintessential Wisconsin. It, it really adds to the day, uh, the really special day for the couples. So, um, you know, that's kind of the background on it. Now, Late last fall, the legislature passed and the governor signed a bill into law, which became Act 73. Um, and Act 73 changes the definition of public place so that it now covers uh, virtually any place in the state of Wisconsin that is available for rent, including these private event venues, wedding barns. Uh, it makes a number of exemptions in the law, so not every uh, space that it would apply to has to get a license. Um, but what it does now is it puts wedding barns in an untenable situation. If they want to continue to allow alcohol at their venues, they have to either obtain a liquor license, which in some cases is impossible, uh, but in all cases is, is a difficult endeavor, or they have to get a new permit under the law called a no-sale event venue permit, which limits them to just six events per year and only one event per month which effectively puts them out of business. I mean, no business can operate if they can only be open for six days per year. Uh, so that's, that's where we stand now. And uh, yesterday, on behalf of two wedding barn owners, we filed a lawsuit in western Wisconsin. We are challenging uh, those provisions of Act 73 that change that definition of public place um, as being unconstitutional. So... I guess let's boil it down for, because we were chatting off air for our listeners about how this, I mean, you've already explained how this will essentially put some barn uh, or what barn event owners out of business. What specifically are you asking um, of the Department of Revenue? And, and I mean, what's, what's, the, what's the goal in, in uh, this lawsuit? Yeah, so uh, the lawsuit specifically asks to have those sections of Act 73, which change the definition of public place, which expand the definition of public place, to have those sections of that law declared unconstitutional. So they would be null and void 
And then our clients and private event venue owners all around Wisconsin would be able to just continue operating as they have been uh, for years. And, and that's the goal. And, you know, these are uh, safe venues. They're, you know, very popular, increasing in popularity even. Um, and it's just not government's place to come in and, and pick winners and losers here. So we talked about this off air too, but uh, uh, Wisconsin Act 73 was a, well, passed with bipartisan support. So there were uh, obviously both Republicans and Democrats that that voted in favor of this, and then it was obviously signed into law by uh, Governor Evers. So specifically, is that, well, I'll just ask this, was there anything anything positive that was accomplished in Act 73? Yeah, I mean, that's where, that's where it really gets interesting. Act 73 was what they call an omnibus piece of legislation. It was, you know, more than 100 pages long. The, the original bill was huge. Uh, it did a lot of stuff. Um, it made it a lot easier for uh, places like wineries and breweries to operate. It did a lot of good stuff. Um, so Act 73, on the whole, uh, is certainly not a, a bad piece of legislation, um, certainly these provisions related to private event venues are bad, and unfortunately they got tucked into this, this piece of legislation. So those lawmakers had to kind of, they have to take an upper bound vote on the entire bill, and, and ultimately it got, it got passed, which is unfortunate. But, you know, as you said, it's bipartisan support for it, bipartisan opposition to it. I mean, this is an issue uh, that really transcends partisan politics. I think uh, people of all political stripes in Wisconsin uh, certainly support our farmers and and uh, support entrepreneurship and uh, don't believe that government should be in the business of uh, deciding who who wins and who loses in the free market. So, I know that you're not a psychic or you'd be in a different um, industry, but uh, I've got a magic eight ball in in the studio here. But what do you predict is or what do you anticipate is going to happen? Do you do you believe that there will be some sort of exceptions carved out for wedding barn owners? Uh, yeah, I mean, our, our hope is to have the entire chain struck down, so we wouldn't even need the exceptions on it. I mean, under under current law, the way it stands now, uh, buildings that are owned by municipalities, uh, counties, parks, private colleges, uh, clubs, um, buildings that are in a professional football or baseball stadium district on the day of events at the stadium are exempt. Parking lots are exempt. I mean, there's this whole laundry list of exemptions from the law, uh, which make it certainly seem like they were explicitly targeting wedding barns um, it, with this bill. And, and that's part of our legal claim. Uh, we think that actually violates our clients' equal protection rights under the Wisconsin Constitution uh, because of the way that government is regulating similar entities differently. Um, but in terms of uh, time frame on it, you know, the, the actual changes that we're challenging take full effect on January 1st of 2026. But these businesses are really feeling the impact of it right now. Obviously, couples plan their weddings out years in advance. Sure. Uh, and so we want to be able to, to hopefully get them relief as soon as we can. Uh, we think there is some good precedent for that in the courts. Um, and we're hopeful that uh, once they get their day in court, uh, a, neutral, a neutral court will be able to uh, see that this law is prohibited by the Constitution and, and grant them relief. Uh, you know, I guess... I'm curious because this this issue has been it's kind of been an ongoing and and prior to it being signed into law I I I want you know I had a, a member of the uh Tavern League um join me on the show to talk about this topic and and I mean I guess what I'm trying to wrap my mind around is why those that that uh own a venue that's completely different from the wedding barn model and really don't really don't um, serve as a they're, they're not competition for bars I mean so so that's why I'm having trouble understanding why why this even had to why it had to come to this frankly yeah you know I, I don't know uh, the answer to that I wish I, I wish I did I, and I think you're right though um, you know I think in many cases wedding barns are very complimentary of, of local establishments. Uh, certainly when the event is over, people who want to uh, continue the fun um, go elsewhere. <laughs> and there are places they can go, you know, the local tavern and things like that. And, um, you know, I think this is, uh, unfortunately, they, they viewed this industry as competition and, and supported these changes to uh, make it more difficult for them to operate, which, uh, 
which is too bad. But again, uh, our clients are looking forward to, to having their day in court, and we're uh, hopeful that at the end of the day, they'll be able to continue operating as they have been safely uh, for years to come. So I presume in, in some respects, Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty perhaps was trying their best to lobby on behalf of wedding barn owners, because that's another piece of this, is that they don't have a lobbyist. I, I, I don't, I, at least as far as I understand, they don't have a lobbyist that could p- potentially put pressure on legislators, whereas these other entities that, well, I, I guess, presumably uh, believe that they would benefit from Act 73, you know, like the Tavern League, they do have a strong lobby. So um, in some respects, that's what, what Will is doing, is stepping in to that gap to help wedding barn owners. Yeah, and, and certainly our public policy team uh, was in there talking to lawmakers on this and uh, and trying to fight for it. It's, you know, really a, a kind of David versus Goliath, uh, uh, you know, situation here. Wedding barns are, are the smaller entity. They, you know, they certainly don't have the political sway or clout of some of the other um, interested parties that were involved in this. And, you know, like I said, the bill itself was this omnibus piece of legislation that had so much stuff in it. I mean, it touched everything from wedding barns to the, you know, shipping of alcohol into the state. It it really was just, you know, across the board did did a number of things. And so, you know, it, it is what it is at this point. And, uh, you know, we always uh, try to resolve everything as, as much as we can short of litigation. But in this case, litigation was really the only option to ensure that these businesses would have a chance to continue operating uh, in the future. So, Lucas Weber, I, I know that you're a busy guy, and we talked about this off air. I would ask you, and I, you know, and I want to tell you what to do. But if you have at, uh, you know, at your fingertips a list of the legislators that voted in support of this, I would like it, and I want to share it with our listeners at some point during the course of the morning. So, if you can please, if if at all possible, get that to me so that I can uh, let uh, our listeners know. If they're curious about, because as we said, it's a bipartisan bill, and and clearly there were legislators that supported were in support of it here, perhaps in central Wisconsin that uh, that were well that there were some that voted against it and some that supported it, and that I think that would be useful information to have. Yeah, we'll we'll do, and I appreciate uh, appreciate the time today, and thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, thank you, Lucas Weber from Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty. You can read more about this issue on their website, will-law.org. Have a great day, Lucas. Take care. You too, Mike. Take care. Thank you.